Earlier this morning, I had a phone call from a television reporter from Southern Illinois who asked why this news conference isn't being held down there, and had we ever been down to Southern Illinois. And I said, of course, we had been down to Southern Illinois many times. We've testified at hearings at Ulan. Um, we've, uh, of course, been to Springfield many times. We've been to TAMS. But that the issues uh, that uh, are caused by TAMS affect people in Chicago as much or more than people in Southern Illinois. That is that the uh, men themselves who are locked in long-term solitary confinement at TAM Supermax, they're mostly from the Chicago area. Their families and communities are in the Chicago area. The costs, uh, financial, moral, spiritual, and every other respect, are borne by people in the Chicago area as much as those elsewhere in the state. So it's absolutely fit and, and uh, proper that we have this, uh, this conference here today. So again, thank you very much. I'm going to be introducing the people as we go. The first speaker will be Laurie Jo Reynolds, who's the chief organizer of the reform and advocacy group TAMS Year 10. So Laurie Jo, please. Hi. First, I want to thank Governor Quinn for closing TAM Supermax prison. It takes guts to close prisons, and most governors lack guts. Downstate legislators and the guards union are fighting to the death to keep TAMS open and keep all the other prisons open, even if they're two-thirds empty. TAMS is two-thirds empty. But they have a tough opponent in Governor Quinn. Closing TAMS is the right thing to do, and he is resolute. I'm here with members of TAMS Year 10, the coalition that launched a legislative campaign in 2008 against the use of long-term isolation at TAMS. From the day it opened, TAMS has been a financial boondoggle and a human rights catastrophe. The prison was designed for one purpose, sensory deprivation and isolation. This notion was built into the architecture. Illinois built a prison with no yard, no cafeteria, no classrooms, no chapel, and no communal activities. Men only leave their cell to shower or exercise in a concrete pen alone. Food is pushed through a slot in the cell door. Humans are social creatures. We need the sight, sound, and touch of others. Physical interaction and sensory feedback are basic physiological needs. Without them, people experience sensory deprivation, distortion, and mental crisis. Hallucinations, depression, suicide attempts, self-mutilation, psychosis, and other serious mental disorders are an expected known consequence of isolation, and they're common at TAMS. For 14 years now, we've paid exorbitant costs for a prison that drives men to compulsively attempt suicide, to cut themselves, to smear excrement. You don't need the, Nas the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture to tell you that the state should not be driving its citizens to the most extreme, out-of-bounds behaviors. The UN Special Rapporteur on C Torture has called for a global ban on this type of solitary. But as we stand here, there are men with schizophrenia and other serious mental disorders in the supermax. Men, people cut their arms, poke holes in their necks, and the D Department of Corrections can't get them to stop. The only way to get them to stop is to take them out of isolation. But the Guards Union and downstate legislators nevertheless support this regime. They assert that TAMS makes them safer, even though all the research indicates that supermax prisons do not deter or decrease violence. And in fact, the states that have recently closed their supermaxes or sharply curtailed their use, such as Mississippi and Maine, have seen prison violence plummet. Supermax prisons make us less safe. They exacerbate mental illness, increase tensions, induce hostility, and worsen behavior. This type of confinement is debilitating, and it undermines the ability of these men to succeed in the community after their release. We took a snapshot of who was in prison in TAMS in 2008 and found that one-third of those men were returning to society in the next 10 years. We returned these men to neighborhoods with crime, unemployment, foreclosures, and poverty, and then asked them to struggle with the lasting mental health problems that the state of Illinois gave them. This is incompatible with basic human decency and with common sense. International human rights monitors have condemned this prison because of the extreme harm it causes. Amnesty International's public statement is titled, TAMS Supermax Flouts International Standards for Humane Treatment. Today, we are asking that AFSCME and downstate legislators for once acknowledge the harmful effect that their prison has on the men there, their families, and communities. Talk about jobs if you want, but extend to these families the common courtesy of acknowledging what everyone of conscience knows 
about supermax prisons. They destroy lives. Instead of treating TAMS as a jobs program, legislators and downstate and union officials should press for sustainable and humane economic development. We thank Governor Quinn for his decision to close TAMS. It's an expression of our state's priorities and ideals. Governor Quinn chose fiscal prudence over pork barrel spending, evidence-based policies over myth and fear, and human rights over vengeance. We support him. Janice, I see a number of the Thames moms who just come in the room. Janice, can see if you'd like to join us, please feel free to take a sign and join us. Um, now it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Representative Danny Davis. Uh, Representative uh, Davis is one of the stalwart figures when it comes to defending people who are poor, who are working class, um, who are uh, vets, uh, people who need their rights champion. When there's a cause, he's there for women demanding equal pay, whether it's uh, uh, gay men and women looking for their rights to marry and other equal rights, whether it's an uh, anti-war struggle or an unjust war in Iraq, he's there on the front lines to struggle and to speak out against it. Uh, he's been with us from the beginning in the effort to close TAMS, and it's again great honor and pleasure to represent U.S. Representative Danny Davis, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I was hoping to be last um, so I could hear what everybody else had to say and then build on that. Plus, I've been taught that in the real order of things in the world in which we hope for, sometimes the first will be last and the last will be first. I'm delighted and pleased to be here with all of you those of you who believe in the rights of people and the dignity of humanity, those of you who believe that people should have the opportunity, no matter who they are, where they are, to experience a decent level of living. You know, I was thinking of the people who end up oftentimes in prison they come from communities like the one that I live in and represent, where 30 percent of the households in the district have an income of less than $25,000 a year. Fifty percent of the people that I represent have a mortgage consuming 25 percent or more of their household income. Sixteen percent of the adults over the age of 25 do not have a high school diploma. The United States of America, my country, tis of thee, our country, the home of supposedly the people who live better than any other people in a mass way in this world. The United States of America has more of its people in prison per capita than any other developed nation in the world whether you're counting them in actual numbers or if you're counting percentages of the population, we have more than 2.3 million people in our country locked up. The vast majority, 95 percent of the men and women in our prisons, will eventually return home. This means that every year, more than 650,000 offenders are released from state and federal prisons and returned back to civilian life. But then when it comes to Illinois and Chicago and Cook County, just six of Chicago's 77 community areas, there are 77 of those areas in Chicago, but in just six of them, communities like Austin, Humboldt Park, North Lawndale, Inglewood, West Inglewood, and East Garfield Park, all six of these communities are part of the 7th Congressional District. And we account for one-third of all the ex-offenders returning to Chicago. And so when we speak of the need to invest in our community, 
in infrastructure, in education, in energy efficiency, in health care. We're not talking in the abstract. These investments are absolutely critical to the daily life of people who live in the community where I live and work every day. When you put aside all the rhetoric, all the hype, budgets are the real measure of our public priorities. So spending more than $26 million a year to keep 175 men locked in solitary confinement at TAMS when we don't have enough money to pay our teachers, that to me is a misplaced priority. Spending more than $26 million a year to keep 175 men locked in solitary confinement when we don't have enough money to fund the state's share of health care for our medically indigent children. That is a travesty. Spending more than $26 million a year to keep 175 men locked in solitary confinement at TAMS when there are a thousand veterans who are homeless in Chicago on any given night. So when it comes to having made a decision, I stand with the rest of us here to commend and congratulate the governor of the state of Illinois. I know that it was not an easy decision. I know a little something about politics, and I know how people relate and react. And I know that oftentimes people don't pay much in attention to the invisible. People don't pay much attention to those who can't vote or those who don't have the opportunity to make a political contribution. And so I commend the governor for putting principle over politics, for putting the needs, the hopes, and aspirations of these men, of their families, of their children, that they could have the opportunity for a decent life. And I suspect that the governor gets a bit of flack. But you know, when the flack comes, the people in the community need to be there to protect those who would protect them. And so, Mr. Governor, wherever you are, I trust that you've got peace of mind, that you know that there are people in the state of Illinois who agree with you, who believe that this is a tremendous waste of our money, but it's not just the money. It's the hope that men can go to sleep at night and feel that there is the hope for them for a brighter tomorrow. And that's why I am here today. That's why I support the groups who are here. And that's why I thank all of you for being a part of this tremendous decision on the past of those who need our help. Thank you so much, Representative Davis. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, uh, Renee Ferguson, who will be speaking on behalf of U.S. Representative Bobby Rush, who very much wanted to be here, but alas, was at the last minute called to New York to, for important U.N. business. Uh, of course, Representative Bobby, Bobby Rush is known by all of you, uh, uh, a very important uh, legislator, an historic figure in his own right, uh, a key fixture in the history of Chicago and the progressive history of Chicago. Um, uh, for the time being, though, let me just introduce Ms. Um, uh, Ferguson, who will speak on his behalf. Thank you. Uh, I am Congressman Rush's Director of Communications, and um, he was called away to the United Nations today at the last minute. He wanted to be here, and he especially wanted to be here to stand uh, with Governor Quinn for his courage and thank him for his courageous decision on closing TAMS. Uh, he says he is prepared to work with the governor and with the entire congressional delegation of Illinois to help those who are impacted by the closure. Congressman Rush is also sensitive to crime victims as well as to the incarcerated. As a public official, 
you know his life has been an open book. His son was murdered, and he has a nephew who committed murder and is now incarcerated at Pontiac and uh, has spent some time that he has described to us in solitary confinement. So what we discuss today uh, is not theoretical to him. It is very personal. Uh, so let me now read his statement. We cannot afford the high cost, moral or economic, of TAM's Supermax. We cannot afford the cost to our reputation in the world. International human rights monitors like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have published statements about TAMS. The United Nations is considering an investigation of TAMS. We cannot afford the cost to the families of men who are driven to madness by TAMS regime of long-term solitary confinement. And we cannot afford the cost to our own souls because to torture someone is to deny them their humanity, and in so doing, we are denying our own as well. Tam Supermax Prison was designed from its inception in 1998 to keep men in perpetual solitary confinement and in conditions of sensory deprivation for 24 hours a day and for years, going on decades now at a time. Men have been largely prevented from interacting with other human beings, except for the guards who cuff them and shackle them. They only leave their cells to shower and to exercise, and they are fed through a slot in their cell doors. There are no communal spaces, no yards, no cafeterias, no classrooms, no chapel, no place to meet anybody. The UN Committee Against Torture considers such conditions to be cruel, inhuman, and degrading. And when the isolation is indefinite, as at TAMS, he con it is considered to be a form of torture. So what does it say about us when we seek to spread democracy and freedom throughout the world only to violate international law and our own moral and constitutional ethic in downstate Illinois? I believe we are better than this. Indefinite segregation and solitary confinement are torture. We know what the lack of human contact can do to a person's mental state. That is why the practice of solitary confinement was ended in America for more than 100 years. We know from numerous studies that if you subject a group of people to solitary confinement, many will end up with hallucinations, hypersensitivity, paranoia, severe depression, mental breakdown, suicide attempts, and long-lasting mental damage. We know that our Constitution expressly prohibits torture. Our democracy is built on the Eighth Amendment's firm directive against government-imposed cruel and unusual punishment. And putting people with mental illness in a supermax prison has been found to violate the Eighth Amendment. Yet in Illinois, we have mentally ill people in our supermax prison. We need to get them out of there. This is cruel on its face. And what is more unusual than putting a mentally ill person in isolation without treatment so that they just become sicker and sicker and then release them onto the streets, unable to connect with people, unable to make the simplest decisions for themselves, and ultimately allergic to freedom? I believe we are better than this. And while it is true, that some oppose closure because of the fear of job loss, the fact is that the 302 corrections employees at TAMS will be transferred to other prisons in southern Illinois that are currently understaffed. And every single employee who wants a job has the possibility of having a job. TAMS was a mistake. It was built at the height of the hysteria over the so-called war on drugs that has resulted in the mass incarceration of men and women of color throughout this nation. The war on drugs ended up being a war on children and families of color. It's time for rural communities 
to end their addiction to the prison industry. They too are victims of the war on drugs. They built what appeared to be a growing commercial concern and an economic engine that they thought would drive jobs and business. But as a society, our goal should be to have less crime, fewer criminals, fewer victims, and less need for prisons. Right now, TAMS is two-thirds empty. It has 753 beds and houses 238 men. We're paying $26 million a year to house 238 men. The majority of them are poor, black, Latino, and many of them have mental illnesses. There are better paths to rural development than this, and we need to focus on those paths instead of paying the high cost, financial, and moral of TAM Supermax. The state of Illinois is losing $2,200,000 while we delay the closing of TAMS. The members of the Illinois congressional delegation can and must focus on how to make the TAMS community whole while not sacrificing the nation's soul. The price is too high morally, economically, ethically. It was bad public policy to begin with. It's time for us to admit what we're doing is wrong so that we can get about the business of doing what is right. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Ferguson, uh, sorry, Ms. Ferguson and, Represent and Representative Rush. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like now to introduce Democratic State Senate candidate Patricia Van, Pel Van, Van Pelt -Volk um, Watkins. Uh, she will be uh, soon assuming the position uh, pending her election, which we know will indeed occur. And she'll be representing the 5th District in Illinois for we're certain many years to come. Uh, she is a woman of tremendous accomplishments, uh, both in the domains of uh, private uh, industry. Uh, she has uh, a degree as a certified public accountant. She has BA, MA, and PhD degrees. She's been a, a community organizer. She's spoken out on behalf of uh, poor citizens, uh, people who have been imprisoned, people who have suffered uh, foreclosures in the homes. She'll be a marvelous uh, spokesman for her people, for her community for our district. We're very proud to have her here speaking uh, for us. And so please, let's welcome uh, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Thank you very much. I am Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, and I am uh, the Democratic nominee for the 5th Senate District. And the election that's coming up in November, I don't have an opponent, so I will be assuming this seat in January as soon as I wake up and vote for myself that day. <laughs> but I'm here today to support Governor Quinn, and his quest for closing TAMS, and also TAMS Year 10. The women and men who have stood together, worked hard, really pushed the issue to get the information out to the street about what's happening in TAMS. I'm here to support them. I am, uh, some people ask me, well, how can you uh, come out in support of closing TAMS when you're a state official and you need support from the unions? Um, and I do need support from the unions, but more than support for, for the unions, I need to make sure that we continue as a state and a country that, that is, based, is building our work on our values and our morals and not ignoring the destruction of people's lives. My pastor taught us years ago, he said, with every revelation there comes a responsibility. So once you understand what's going on, you have a responsibility to do something about it. So I'm here today to say that TAMS needs to be closed down. It needs to be closed down now. It needs to be closed because people's lives are being impacted, because we're destroying the souls of men, because we're destroying the minds of men, and then we're foolishly releasing them back into the general public pop population, expecting them to function as able-bodied citizens. There's something wrong with that picture. There's something wrong when we can go to bed night after night, wake up morning after morning, knowing and understanding what's happening in Tam's prison and feel okay about ourselves. We have a responsibility to do something about what's happening in Tam's. You know, when, as I learned more and more about what was going on in Tam's and I looked at, uh, some, met with some of the guys that came out of Tam's, it became clear to me that the reason why this continues to go on is because too many people are being silent. You know, it's, it's an old saying that said, in order for any evil to prevail, Good men must say nothing. They must just be silent. 
And if we be silent, woe is the world. Woe is our families. Woe is our children. Woe is our future. Because if we cannot speak up for those that are in need in our generation, in our time, we're the ones that are, this is our watch. It's our time to speak up for civil rights. It's our time to speak up for what's right for society. There's nobody else coming to deliver America. We are the Americans. We have to deliver ourselves. This country was built on freedom, justice, fairness, and the desire to be able to pursue life, liberty, and have, have prosperity. But when we allow ourselves to be quiet, when people are being locked up and shut down and closed out, and we say nothing, we've got to pay a price for it. It would be on us in the end. And maybe it's the 175 guys at TAMS today. But tomorrow, it might be your son. It might be your daughter. God forbid, it may be you. And if there's no one that would be willing to speak up, if there'd be no one that's willing to, to come out front and stand up against the unions, stand up against the lobbyists, and say, this is just wrong, and we have to change this, and we need to change it now, if there's no one to speak up for you, woe is you, and you'll be alone. But thank God today that Governor Quinn has stood up, Tam's your tennis stood up. I'm so proud of all these young ladies and men that have stood up that saying, we must close Tam's now. Yeah. 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 There's no need to wait because no one else is going to come and bring the deliverance that we need in Tam's but us in this generation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce a, a good friend of Tam's Year 10 and many people in this room, and that's Mary Fabry. She's been a great contributor to the issue of civil rights and mental health in Chicago and the United States. She's a clinical psychologist with more than 25 years of experience working with survivors of torture from around the world, and uh, also working with people who've suffered other extreme traumas in the United States and other uh, international post-conflict settings. She recently retired as director of the crucially important Marjorie Kovler Center for the Treatment of Survivors of Torture, and I'm certain that she'll have very uh, apt things to say for us today. Mary Fabry, please. Fabry, F-A-B-R-I. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a different perspective, okay? Um, I agree with absolutely everything everyone has said, but I am gonna point out two signs which I think are really, really critical for us to pay attention to. We support unions that support human rights, yeah. right? Yeah. And torture is a crime, not a career. And when we look at, I've worked 25 years with torture survivors from all over the world. And one of the most debilitating experiences of their captivity is social isolation and sensory deprivation. It destroys who we are as human beings. As other speakers have said, we are social beings. We have a need to interact. And when that is taken away from you, it destroys the capacity. You know, studies were done by the military in the 40s and 50s. Within 48 hours, people who were under sensory deprivation became psychotic. They started hallucinating. We are cre we've created and are continuing to maintain a system which is creating mental illness, not rehabilitating. You know, I always, I grew up with the thought, it was taught to me that the prison system should rehabilitate. And what we are doing is we are deconstructing humanity. So it becomes really, really important for us, as everyone has said and as we, everyone is here, is to stand together and to take, a, to take the courage to say, we support unions that support human rights. I support human rights. And to understand that a prison system that is based on acts of torture, 
sensory deprivation, social isolation in our work at the Kovler Center, that's one of the things we check off as an act of torture. It's an internationally established standard. So what are we doing? Torture is a crime. It is not a career. And so as we think about TAM's closing, we also have to think about our system at this point in time. S mental health clinics are closing, six in Chicago. How many statewide? How many nationwide? It is a time where we need to take a critical look at what we are doing and what we are supporting and look at the basis of what are our human rights. And one of them is for health, mental health, physical health, access to health. So as we look at TAM's closing, we're going to have a lot of challenges, but I think the people in this room are up to those challenges, and I'm in there with you. Thanks. We'll have two more brief comments, and then there'll be time for a question, and then perhaps some more statements after that on the part of some of the uh, mothers of, uh, of Sons and Tams. The uh, next speaker is Tom Wilson, who is a community development organizer for Healthcare Access Living. So please, Tom, yes, come speak you. to us. Thank you. Yes, I'm glad to be here today representing Access Living. My name is Tom Wilson, and I do community organizing around healthcare issues. And at Access Living, we're a center that uh, provides services for people with disabilities and advocates for people with disabilities. And that's why I'm here today, to advocate for people with disabilities. Um, thousands of people with mental illness and disabilities are incarcerated in Illinois and disproportionately placed in isolation. This is both cruel and exorbitantly expensive. Yet critical services, including mental health supports, substance abuse counseling, and rehabilitation programming are severely underfunded. The $26 million in the TAMS budget allocation would be better spent on prison and community-based programs that prevent incarceration and decrease recidivism. Sensory deprivation and isolation at TAMS is making people mentally ill, and putting people with mental illness in isolation is counter to treatment, is cruel, and is a form of torture. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Brian, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, <laughs> Brian is going to speak to us for one, for one moment I, uh, about the issue of mental illness uh, caused uh, by incarceration attempts. Uh, Brian was a uh, incarcerated at Tams, and so he knows of what he speaks. Please come up here. My name is Brian Nelson. I work at Uptown People's Law Center. I did 12 years in Tams in solitary confinement. Prior to Tams, I was in a medium minimum security prison. I went in and out the prison 24 hours a day unescorted. 24 hours later, I was in Tams. I never saw a psychiatrist took psychotropic medication or hurt myself out of 16 years in prison until I got to TAMS. I say it was, I arrived at TAMS, I weighed about 170 pounds at my lowest because of the depression, sitting in a cell by myself, I weighed 119 pounds. You lose every will there is. You don't talk to nobody, you don't see nothing, you feel abandoned by society. Guys getting out of TAMS now, and there's a couple hundred of us out on the streets. There's only two of us here in this room because it bothers us so much to talk about it. How do you talk about going backwards in your brain day after day where you hurt yourself just to feel something? And there's a Johnny Cash song, you need to feel the pain. You cut yourself just to feel something because you're so alone in a gray box, no TV, no radio, nothing. One of the things that kept me alive was faith. I copied the Bible word for word. I walked for 15 to 20 hours a day until my feet bled because you're like an animal in a zoo. You're in this little gray room the size of a bathroom with nothing. You don't touch nobody, nobody touches you. The food comes in, 
My mother comes to see me, she cries. Every bone in my body protruded because I lost the will to live. I just didn't care no more. Then they sent me out here. And they did something different with me than everybody else that was released from TAMS. They wanted a reintegration evaluation or they would violate my parole and send me back to TAMS. Well, what was this? My parole officers didn't know. Mental health people didn't know. Ex-warden at TAMS, Charles Hinsley, said it like it was. We want to know if you're going to come out here and snap and kill a bunch of people. Well, why do you put me through this if you're so worried about this? Why do you do this to somebody if this is a concern you have? And I was one of the first guys that arrived at TAMS, and there's over 40 guys that arrived at the same time still sitting in TAMS. My job now, I work with the guys in TAMS. I'm the prison rights coordinator, and I get letters of a guy that cut his testicles off, cut his fingers off. And this is every day, but they keep it hid. They don't want the public to know. There's no prisons in Chicago area. Everybody from Chicago is shipped down south to create jobs and to hide what's going on in TAMS is just plain wrong. And then to say, okay, bye, get out. They didn't teach me how to get along with people again. When it came time for my release, I went from solitary confinement, poof, get out. And I was supposed to adapt out here. A lot of guys from TAMS are a problem that we're going to face. They're applying for Social Security because we don't know how to adapt around people. I'm nervous because I'm in a crowded room. The exit is over there. I got to go through a room. I don't know where to run. It's a problem we face. The first time I sat with Lori Joe and them, I could cry. All I got to do is think about that friggin' gray box. And it's like somebody walking up, punching me in the head, punching me in the head over and over, and it knocks you down so friggin' bad. And they were saying, this is America? This is how we help each other? And it's the union? Some of the, office, the officers, are, they're, they're men. They want jobs. They don't need friggin' TAMs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Th thanks, Brian. There are many other people here, um, former prisoners, uh, parents of prison mothers of prisoners, who could say a lot about uh, the conditions of TAMS. And they, they will, and they'll be available for questions and discussion. But why don't we take a break now and uh, so that the press can ask ask questions of any of the speakers or anyone else. And then after that, uh, we'll have a few more minutes for people uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, the conditions of TAMS. So uh, please, is there any questions? Is there any research on bad things done by TAMS inmates once they do get out? Um, not specific, as far as I know, not specifically about TAMS prisoners, but there have been studies of supermax prisons in other states in which they found that the incidence of violent recidivism and new crimes committed by people who have been in supermax uh, are higher than those who have not been a supermax. People who have the same level of uh, criminal offenses, the same age, everything else factored in, being put into a supermax makes one more likely to react in a violent way than not. That said, um, one of the experts about solitary confinement, the psychiatrist Terry Cooper, who's really one of the world's experts on solitary confinement, has emphasized that what often happens to men or women in isolation after they get out is more that they implode, more of Brian's story, that they have a lot of trouble being around people, they avoid people, they can't be in social settings. We have several guys who try to come to meetings, walk through the door, and just can't do it and leave. And they have tried more than once. Sometimes they'll go sit in their car and, tr and try to come back in. And so that is a very common um, response, is more of a breakdown than necessarily acting out. Brian might have a quick answer, too. In the prison system, there's well over 300 guys that have left TAMS that have not been returned to TAMS. Many of them are in medium and minimum security prisons already. Every month prior to the, the, the court order to stop transferring guys from TAMS, inmates have left TAMS. And we correspond with them through our law center. And these guys, are, they're not violating no rules. They're not getting sent back. I think it's maybe 8% of the guys were sent back to TAMS for something wrong. There's many of them that are in Big Muddy, Lawrence, Western Correctional Center, some of them have been in Stateville for 10 years. And it's, most of them are not going back. I understand it's not everybody goes to TAMS for violating rules. I didn't catch no ticket. They put me there because I was a writ writer. I did lawsuits. So we don't have a history of violence prior to TAMS. So a lot of guys get out and it's, they just go right back to society. It's a shock that 
that nobody asked this question, and we have roughly eight pages of names at the law center of guys that have successfully left TAMS and never gone back. Yeah. I, I should say that two-thirds of the people uh, in TAMS now were not sent there for having committed an act of violence in a prison from which they were transferred. Two-thirds. Uh, other questions? Yes. Have you spoken at all with AFSCME or downstate legislators who are opposed to closing the prisons? Like, maybe I'm not sure if you guys might have seen that. Has there been a dialogue at all with the union or with downstate? Yeah, um, a number of us in TAMS Year 10 and legislators have spoken to uh, representatives from AFSCME. Uh, but they have been just uh, adamant that uh, they want to preserve the jobs there at all costs. Uh, uh, they change their story. Sometimes they say that's because uh, TAMS is a prison that they feel adds safety, a safety valve to the system. But then when um, it was clear that uh, the governor was committed to closing the prison, uh, legislators changed their story and said, no, well, we just want their jobs. We just want it to be any kind of prison. And they then agitated to have it become a minimum security prison. Uh, a conversion that would be highly expensive, impractical, and unnecessary. So we have spoken to them. Uh, you're absolutely right that on most issues, uh, certainly the uh, government representatives here uh, and all of us see eye to eye uh, on union struggles. We're great supporters of unions, many of us are members of unions. But on this particular issue, uh, AFSCME is simply just plain wrong. Please. Um, if the legislature overrides Quinn's veto and gives him back the funding, he does not have to spend the money. And Governor Quinn has been so resolute that he's closing these prisons, they're not needed, we need the money elsewhere, that we believe if they give him the money back, he'll just say, I'm still keeping camp, you know, he still doesn't have to open it, I'm still closing the prison. But I also should point out, which um, was pointed out, that we are spending two million, I think, Two million dollars a month, two million four hundred thousand dollars a month on TAMS alone to keep it open, and so that money is being pulled out of the Department of Corrections budget. We are spending huge amounts of money to keep it open. It's inevitable that it's going to close, but AFSCME is dragging this lawsuit out as long as they can, and we could be—we're cutting programs left and right that that money could be spent on. We feel it's inevitable that TAMS is going to close because the governor's resolute and because the days of supermax prisons are numbered. Around the country, people are closing supermax prisons. So we're very frustrated that we're spending money. We're spending money just to drag this out. So why are you here today? We are here today to, to show that there's a lot of people fully supporting the closure of TAMS and that elected officials and human rights advocates fully support Governor Quinn in closing TAMS. Wait, he's not press. Is there any yeah. other press? Yeah, y'all go answer that. <laughs> well, there are a lot of things that you can do with money. Um, <laughs> I think that we are here because it's a moral issue. And while TAM is today, other decisions are going to be made tomorrow, next legislative session. When the budgeting was taking place, there were lots of options and alternatives put on the table in terms of what to do with money. Right down the street from where my office was located, there are 300 people housed in a facility called Crossroads. And there was some possibility that Crossroads would be closed. And obviously, we lobbied and advocated that these 300 people not be turned out on the streets, but they continue to get the benefit of the services and programs being provided to them. What those of us who've been involved with the whole question of recidivism know that if individuals get help, they are less likely to return to prison. We know that if they don't get any help within a three-year period, two-thirds of them in all likelihood will have done what we call re-offend, and about half of them will be back in prison. And so then we keep spending money. It becomes like a, a revolving door. It is secular. 
if the recidivism rate drops, then the number of people who are incarcerated drops. And we can use some of that money that we are spending on incarceration for our school systems, for our infrastructure, and for other things that are perhaps more valuable because we will have reduced the number of people who are actually incarcerated. Thank you. Any other questions from the press? Any other press questions? Why don't we? Oh, I just wanted to say one thing to Matthew, um, that also we not only um, have Sorry, we, this campaign has been going on since 2008 to try to do something about the problem at TAMS, and we've focused on the legislature and, of course, tried to pressure the governor, who at that time was Blagojevich. And we did meet with AFSCME at that time to talk about reforming the prison, and we also met with the downstate legislators to talk about reforming that prison. Yeah, and one other quick thing, um, in, uh, Reverend Hood was just here from Interfaith Illinois, which is an alliance of clergy across the state of over 300 churches, and they um, they are making a statement that they are in full support of the governor's decision to close TAMS, and that should be out this week. Okay. I'm now going to just ask uh, people who are standing behind me and elsewhere if they would like to make very brief statements, maybe one or two minutes, just saying um, uh, what they feel, the experiences that they've had. Uh, when they do so, please uh, give your name uh, really clearly so that the, the uh, people in the press know who you are. Uh, and so why don't we just do that, and again, one or two minutes each if you don't mind. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I want to thank everybody for coming out, congressmen, senators, everybody. Thank you. My name is Brenda Smith, and I'm a mother. My son was incarcerated at the age of 17, and he's been in TAMS for 13 years. And just hearing Brian talk about that, it just broke me. In all this time, I have not been allowed to speak to him on the phone. And due to difficult visitation rules and the fact that TAMS is almost seven hours from Chicago, I have a hard time getting someone to drive me for visits. He has not seen or talked to his son or father in over 10 years. And my daughter told me, Mom, I can't visit him in that place. I cannot handle it. Uh, there is a young man at Tam that cut off part of his genitals, and it was in the newspapers. And the staff there said he did it to get his weight. My son has also cut himself. I don't have any idea how many times. He doesn't want me to know. I was horrified by the fact that this was going on. In his letters to me, he says, Mom, I don't want to die here. I don't want him to die there either. And I'm a heartbroken mother, and my son is buried alive. To ask me, human suffering should not be the basis of the Southern Illinois economy. And to the public, please help us close TAMS Correctional. It has done a lifetime of damage. I got a letter the other day from my son, and he described being in TAMS uh, he says it's been like 10 tours in Iraq. And he says, I know I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And he says the only answer is suicide. But he says that's not an option for me because if I do that, then they win. So please help us close, Tams. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. My name is Beverly K. Watson. Uh, my son is in Tams. My son was born to two police officers. After 33 years with the Chicago Police Department and serving the citizens of Chicago as a police officer, youth officer, and a detective, I find myself as the mother of a prisoner. No mother wants or expects this to happen. When people see my son, they see Illinois Department of Corrections Prisoner number K58251. I see a broken human being that saw the violence in the streets of Chicago and internalized it. I see a man that has spent most of his life institutionalized with behavioral problems and mental health issues. When your son is in the custody of the state, you want him to be treated fairly. You want him to receive the treatment and help that he needs. You don't want to go to bed at night fearing for his well-being, wondering if he's breaking down, knowing that he's pacing alone in a concrete tomb. 
I only want the best for my son and the sons and daughters of other Illinois citizens. I want them to learn the skills necessary to become productive citizens when they get out. I know that this will never happen at TAMS. It is an inhumane warehousing situation. It has contributed greatly to his mental illness. I still believe in him, and I know that he can become a successful, productive individual that contributes every day to the success of others. That will never happen if he has no contact with another human being for 24 hours a day. The money that is wasted in warehousing the prisoners at TAMS can be better spent giving them an education, re-entry skills, and psychological treatment. Governor Quinn, I had never hoped, I never had any hope until you announced your plan to close TAMS. Please have the fortitude to follow your heart and close TAMS. Good afternoon. My name is Janice Burnham. My brother is actually one of the men who was transferred from TAMS. Um, and um, I'd like to thank Governor Quinn for his courageous decision. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I'd like to thank Brian because, as he stated, he was uh, in a mi minimum security prison, um, you know, a trustee of some sorts. And the next day he was in TAMS. We hear the constant refrain from downstate that TAMS is for the worst of the worst. And um, murderers, rapists, people who've committed crimes while already incarcerated. My brother was put in TAMS because they said, this is the report they gave after he had been there a month, when actually it took a federal case for them to have to start telling these men why they were even in TAMS. And they said he, they put him there because he told someone they couldn't go somewhere. So, you know, I, I just um, want to say thank you. And I hope that you know, TAMS is closed down because it's a matter of public record what this does to people. I think uh, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said you can judge the character of a country by how they treat their voiceless. And these men at this point don't have a voice. So it's up to us to make sure that they do. Um, they talked about the sensory deprivation, all the gray walls. While my brother was there, he talked about the guards coming through at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, banging on the gates. So in addition to sensory deprivation, it's sleep deprivation, and shamelessly, it's shades of Abu Ghraib. Thank you. Thank you. We just have two more uh, speakers, just so the uh, the patience of the press and others uh, isn't too, taxed too much. We have two more very brief presentations. One is Akeem Berry. Good evening. My name is Reginald Akeem Berry, senior, and I, too, am an alumni of Towns Super Maximum Prison. Uh, I served eight years in Towns, had been kidnapped, um, and yes, yeah, was one of the very first people who was placed in that, in that mad house that they call an institution. Uh, I will appeal to the hearts and the sentiments of the people who've gathered here today that you again speak with someone. You know, call your legislator, call you know, whoever you can, your pastor, call people who will get involved and lock arms with us because this is a true fight. You know, there's no way that they should be building an economy off the suffering of people. You know, I recognize when I left towns, when I first came to towns, there was dilapidated houses, worn down roads, and the like. And on my way up out of there eight years later, they had brand new roads, they had hotels, they had two, three cars in the garage, and police guards usually actually make jokes and say, I dare you to, to, to step on my toe on the way to the hospital or something, because I'm going to get a lawsuit and I'm going to be fixed for life. And so with these sort of mentalities that are out there exploiting our people, you know, for mere profits, again, I think it's time you bring a cessation to this. I appeal to you, thank you, and God bless. Um, and uh, Fred uh, Friedman, uh, please, will be speaking now. Um, please introduce your... Hi, uh, my name is Fred Friedman. I, I represent Next Steps, a uh, consumer survivor of mental health uh, issues, advocacy organization. 
Uh, I've been told to be very brief, so there's really only two things I, I'm going to say. One, um, there is a, three things I'm going to say. One is that there's a feeling that we, of course, want to help the mentally ill, but only the good mentally ill, the nice people. Uh, but the reality is, is that you can't help some without helping everybody. And the reality is, is that uh, anybody, uh, given enough stress, given enough problems, is at risk of uh, joining Supermax. So um, we join with our brothers and sisters in the prison. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say was, uh, it just so happens that today is Yom Kippur, the day of, of forgiveness. Um, and uh, it reminded me of what uh, Jefferson said, that he uh, trembles when he thinks that God is a just God, and he prays that God is uh, merciful. And so uh, if ever, uh, as a country and as a state, we need to forgive and to be merciful, now is the time. The third thing I wanted to say uh, was just to put this in perspective. Uh, you heard that six clinics are closed here in the city of Chicago. Two million dollars would reopen those, those clinics. One month, one month that's being kept to uh, keep these prisons open would provide services to literally thousands of people here in the city of Chicago. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. That will conclude the formal part uh, of our press conference. There are others here who I'm afraid haven't had a chance to speak and do have many important things to say. So uh, any members of the press who would like to, to speak to them, they'll all be available uh, for, for questions and, co and conversation. Thanks again so much for coming.